the group of Arasaka mercenaries had finally reached their target location. Fighting through a seven-story conapt filled with lethal devices and robots had already reduced it to the hallways of hell. A hallway of hell that, oddly enough, had the body of Marge Simpson lying in it, covered with fresh-baked pie. Yeah, long story. One complicated even further by the horde of corporate zombies that rushed past the room the moment they entered. The room was exactly what you would expect of a highly wanted netrunner. The guy was holed up in a cramped space, one packed with gear, a generator, wires and cabling everywhere, a few personal robots scurrying around, and no furniture in the normal sense of the word. Before even taking in the surroundings to its fullest extent, several automated weapon systems begin lining up. The mercenaries open fire. Stray bullets ricocheting across the room, grazing each combatant and dispatching the defenses all the while making a mess of what was already a difficult to navigate room. The moment all the defenses were cleared, they got to work. There wasn't a moment to spare in their schedule. The Netrunner had to be found, and quick. With the help of the group techie, everything was narrowed down to a single fridge. Readying their weapons, the group opened the door. The interior was not separated into normal refrigerator and freezer segments. Rather, it was one compartment full of ice and wires, with a body lying within. The mercenaries hesitated to shoot. Not because their orders were unclear by any means. It was fear. Fear of an inhumanely wide grin on their target's face. One of not only pain, but pleasure. It was this moment of hesitation that allowed their objective to be completed on its own. The iced body, still curled in the fetal position, slid out of the fridge onto the floor, completely devoid of life, yet maintaining that rictus grin. Suddenly, a set of red flags whip up next to the fridge and start waving maniacally. An old-fashioned bell by the door starts ringing loudly, and a red light flashes over a printer that's next to the bell. The printer spits out three pieces of paper as strains of Beethoven's Ode to Joy starts booming from the stereos throughout the con act. All the firing suddenly stops as confetti explodes from the ventilation ducts, and a small arachnoid robot drops from the ceiling, clutching a high-density data chip in its limbs. It says, Have a cookie. You have 30 seconds before the grand finale. It was a warning to escape with their lives. A rare gesture in Night City, and an even creepier one from the legend Raish Barmas himself. In the year of 2077, the use of computer technology has become truly universal. Regular Janes and Joes know how to use these systems to access info, communicate, and even fight. But there are others who can use the same tech to work wonders. Netrunners. A netrunner knows the ins and outs of computer systems, the programming languages, and even write or mod a killer virus. Deck in hand, they're just as dangerous as a corporate soldier armed to the teeth. While netrunners were once considered the rulers of cyberspace, using their skulljacks to roam a vast, global net and special suits to cool themselves, the landscape has changed to something unrecognizable. The era ended with the cataclysm known as the Data Crash an event entirely orchestrated by the greatest netrunner of all time, Raish Barmas. A genius plagued by what most would claim is schizophrenia. The guy was always talking about aliens, conspiracies, and the gateway to hell in the net. If they made a show about him, it would basically be Mr. Robot. Barmas was already a living legend of the early 2020s, but the data crash cemented him further into the history of not only Night City, but the world. When the virus was released, it infected 78.2% of the net in a matter of months. Net traffic came to a grinding halt, corporations lost billions as the stock market destabilized, and countless military-grade AI were unshackled and mutated into extremely dangerous entities. He had single-handedly made the net a hellscape that was near impossible to navigate until the later 2040s in which Netwatch put up the Black Wall. So. Just who is Raish Barmas? Where did he come from, and how did he manage to single-handedly perform the world-altering data crash? Today, we will be decrypting the story and truth behind Night City's most talented netrunner. This is the legend of Raish Barmas.
Raish was born in the year 1992, and it wouldn't be long before he kicked off his netrunning career. You might expect a genius to star around the age of 9 like Spider Murphy did, but you might want to deplete yourself of any and all expectations. They will only hurt you in the long run while we're talking about Barmos. He began netrunning at the age of 4 years old. At such a young age, most would still be talking to their imaginary friends. Well, he probably was. Not because he was 4, but because he did it in adulthood as well. But because he was so inexperienced, he made the mistake of using his real name, not knowing the risks. But by the time he realized it was a stupid move, or any consequences could have followed, it was already good enough that it didn't matter. It was like Bartmoss had a sixth sense for net running. In his early teen years, Bartmoss even tried to go legit in writing software. He worked with some of the best companies, always using his real name. The companies really did this under the assumption that he wouldn't run against their own systems. Raish had always promised with a full intent not to double cross his employers or go snooping around their closets. Yet, his promise only ever lasted about two weeks. It would become glaringly obvious that serious breaches of security would occur wherever he worked about one month after he signed on. Another two months, and the corp would finally figure out he was imploding their systems in the name of justice, and he'd have to disappear. He always knew when he'd been found out, and made a grand escape in good time. To set a specific example, he once worked for a year at a smaller firm, CCI Development. For what it's worth, they didn't even have any skeletons in the closet, so things worked fine and the company came out with some innovative new products, including the Demon series and a powerful new database system. Unfortunately for this small firm, Armas was never the type to sit still and be a lapdog. He required some spontaneous excitement to keep his heart beating. So, he dropped a few surprises into the database code, including a full-blown quote-unquote political movie. When word got back to the company, they made a big mistake in their response. They fired Bartmoss. There's a cardinal corporate rule that can't be broken in the industry. Never fire someone who knows your system and has the talent to use that knowledge. Kill them instead. Within a week, their entire computer system had fried its own brains, and the company went belly up. Armos took this opportunity to sell the source code to the demon programs to several software houses simultaneously and had enough money that he would never have to work again. Of course, each publisher thought they were getting exclusive rights, so they all ended up wanting his scalp. They just didn't understand that Raish didn't believe in exclusive rights. When Bartmoss turned 17, he had been running the net for 13 years and had a full set of high quality trodes and a library of software that the likes of which no one else had ever seen. It was around this time that a young Spider Murphy would track down Bartmoss, all to warn him that her corporate puppet of a father had killed his SIN a state identification number given to every voting citizen in the US. This ID encoded a person's criminal attacks history, as well as their DNA pattern, all of which is duplicated in state government mainframes. If your sin is deleted, you can't legally get a job, you can't vote, and your rights are pretty much hash. Not that all of this really mattered much for a skilled cyberspace criminal like Bartmoss. It was because of this chance encounter and Murphy's unique net running skills at her young age that the two would become extremely close friends. Throughout the years, she got training from Bartmoss and the two experimented with everything and tried every interface that they had heard of. Their shared knowledge of tech and the net was unrivaled. Raish Bartmoss, along with Spider Murphy and a couple talented netrunners named Dog and Edger, would run the net for fun and lynch netwatch hacks without profit, all because it was not only the right thing to do, but because they enjoyed doing the impossible. Shortly after the Pacifica region of the net was formed, Bartmoss would run the region with all Cunningham, both of which would come to form extremely fond memories of this region of the net and their time net running together. Walt would even admit later on that these times were her best net running memories. By the early 2010s, Bartmoss moved into a CONAP building on the edge of the combat zone, where he arranged for everyone who did not have a neural implant to leave the building, and instead arranged to have corporate workers with neural processors, whereupon he installed within them a hidden subconscious personality program to control them. 
It would use everyone in the building for surveillance and protection, making them the perfect corporate zombies. While he was working on the project in secret, he also had another one being set up as well, one with much more devastating effects. The IG transformation algorithm was in its final steps of production, a system that would change the net as everyone knew it. Armas happened to personally know the developers of this unified OS, so he used these connections to sneak his own bit of code in without raising any alarms. He had programmed several backdoors into a protocol code that would allow him to make changes that would affect any computer that ever logged into this new net which would essentially act as a cheat code to mass target any OS from then on. One of these mini backdoors he created had a dead man switch attached to it, meaning in the event of his death, this backdoor would be automatically activated, a final act of revenge against all the corporations he despised and viewed as the ultimate oppressors of humanity. In September of 2014, when the IG protocol was released to reform the net in order to provide a uniform interface look and feel, Artmos stayed jacked in while the rest unplugged, all to watch the entire net redesign itself directly in front of him. There's a reason he was the only one crazy enough to remain plugged in during this process. His biomonitors showed that his heart had stopped for a complete 10 seconds while his sectors were recompiled. He hadn't even noticed this in the moment, but at the time it was all over, it seemed to not have harmed him. In 2015, Raish Bartmas met a woman by the name Kimitara on the net and took her out on a date. They slept together, which Bartmas ended up regretting as she left him soon afterwards. She was a woman infatuated with media personalities to the point of measuring her own self-worth with her ability to seduce them. Fortunately for her, she was pretty good at it. Her problem was that as soon as she had them, she felt the need to move on to the next, which is exactly what she did to Barmos, and it left him pretty burnt, so bad that he became opposed to physical relationships after this event. Eventually, at some point in 2020, Barmos's heart stopped and his physical body died for unknown reasons, though his life support machine sensed it and super cooled his body, because he was connected to the net at the time he continued to live there. While this event could have been out of sheer bad luck and some huge coincidence, it wouldn't be unreasonable to assume it could be heart failure as well, a possible consequence of his bad net running habits and being plugged in during the IG protocol transformation. After his physical death, he tried to contact Spider for 10 months, sending her an email to inform her of his death and began telling her his life memories so that they could finish compiling. Raish Bartmoss's Guide to the Net. Around this time, Bartmoss released the Succubus 3 program, and made it look like Spider's net icon as a last big brother sort of prank, so that she would be the lust object to hormonally challenge losers on the net. It intentionally waited until he was dead so that Spider would not be able to take revenge, which in all technicality, he was. It's also stated that due to his hyper cool nervous system, Raish was forced to slowly transmit data, essentially putting him out of the net running biz and forcing him to spend his time in boredom of stasis while doing what he could to finish his guide to the net, which had become his main concern during this time. I would just like to note that in the text, we are told that Barmas would eventually have his system upgraded so he can run the net again, except the stated source for this upgrade is the now retcon Cyber Generation Sourcebook. So while the details in there aren't considered entirely canon, we can make the assumption that Bartmoss had his cyber modem upgraded at some point in this canon timeline, an assumption we will have to stick with for the rest of the story to make sense. In 2021, during the Fourth Corporate War, Militech requested the help of Raish Bartmoss to locate Soul Killer 2.0. While Bartmoss was initially inclined to reject this offer and attack Militech in reprisal, all Cunningham as a Soul Killed AI managed to convince Bartmoss to hunt for Soul Killer. Bartmoss couldn't reject the request from a friend as close as all, so he contracted with Militech. Entirely electronic, of course, as to allow himself power over modifying the contract whenever he deemed necessary. Being the genius he is, it took less than a month for him to track down the Soul Killer program. Elated, he went on a net crime spree against Arasaka and several other non-involved corporations. It was during the course of one such run, his line got traced, 
and suddenly both Militech and Arasaka knew where he was. Both corporations immediately made moves towards the location. Arasaka, of course, sent a massive strike team to take Raish out. The solo Morgan Blackhand and Militech were desperate to save an asset of theirs and move forces to protect him. Who also planned to extract him afterward, haul him off to a Militech covert ops base, and not so incidentally get themselves in a position of being able to blackmail his frozen body. This was a rushed conflict between the two largest corporations in existence over the king of all netrunners. His conapt, in extremely short notice, became a war zone. In the end, Raish never stood a chance. No matter the security he had in place with the corporate zombies and automatic defenses, this is because Arasaka had something that couldn't be blocked, not by any means that Raish had. They dropped an orbital rock onto his conapt. So no matter what forces got to Bartmoss first, the entire operation was completely disrupted and spelled out the death of Bartmoss. What happened as a result could be argued as a loss for Arasaka rather than a win. It was May 26. A young netrunner in her late 20s, long braided red hair and a short stature had just jacked into the net for some programming. In the middle of his session, she was interrupted by an annoying mail alert. It blocked her vision with a fat sausage bee and a virtual voice saying, You've got mail. Oh god, oh god, oh god, it's coming. Now, yes. The message was from her close friend and colleague netrunner, Raish Bartmoss. He knew exactly how to peeve the woman. She hated it. The message contained was simple. It read, Oxbat 1, one of the many codes Raish and her had worked out to arrange meetings and chat rooms and the like. This particular code was unfamiliar and somewhat alarming in comparison to the rest. It had never been used before because it was THE code, the holy mother of god it's all happening now code. With how Raish's mind works, he hadn't even used this code when he got flatlined and confined to the stasis of the freezer unit. In response, Ryder Murphy urgently rushed to this chat room, crashing in with all her icebreakers and killer utilities loaded. Demon's flying point? It works. What she found was somewhat unsettling. Raish was just standing there, calm as could be. Sweetheart, I'm so glad you could make it. He said. None of his standard psychosis even made a cameo in the timbre of his voice. Unlike the average person, being calm and perfectly normal created an eerie atmosphere around Raish. It was just too outside the norm. It was like he was suddenly Mrs. Claus or something. Have I ever told you how much I love you? Come on, they just loaded this romantic little VR at the dunes. Let's go. Just the two of us. Okay. Spider responded nervously. Just hearing him talk like that, that tone, those words, soul chilling. The two went somewhere in Asia, an undisclosed location, in the middle of net nowhere. Suddenly an icon appeared, a simple matte black ball. Every year I come here, and every year I reset this. Then he looked at Spider, right in the eyes. She thought she could see a swelling of tears. But I'm through, Arabella. A wry smile. My cookie is goosed, I suppose I'd say. I wanted, well, I didn't want to do this alone. Someone has to see it. I, I want you to be here. He paused, took a breath. Well, here it goes. He looked at the ball. He waved his hand. A ping, and it changed to a globe. He shook his head. A whistle, and it's changed to a switch. And it squeaked into a big red button. No, that, that's not it either. Then there followed this flurry of noises and icons flashing by, an almost cartoon stream of images. A car, a bomb, a kid, a wallaby, a cream pie, it all went on, accompanied by a cacophony of grunts, pops, barks, you name it. This went on for 30 seconds. Oh, frag it all, he said finally. Covering his eyes, he thrust his forefinger at the shifting icon. As it hit, the icon froze. His finger ended up sticking in the nostril of a clown's head. As it pushed in, there was a squawk. He turned and smiled, half relief, half psychosis. He pulled his finger from the happy clown's nose and whimpered. This was at least moderately familiar turf when it comes to Raish. What have you done? Spider inquired. Her deck began to crash as he answered, jamming the IG transform signal and trashing her tracer routine. What have I done? 
Just wait, Spidey, he said with a demonic smile. Wait, and you'll see. You'll see, you'll see, you'll see, you'll see, you'll see. The communication ended, and with it, the net as everyone knew it. Armas had created the Rabbids as a grand act of defiance against corporate control to be triggered in the event of his death. It was designed to breach all corporate data fortresses and unleash their data onto the net for all to access. In classic Bartmoss fashion, the Rabbids virus were modeled after Bartmoss himself and were capable of replicating in high speeds, meaning that they would roam in massive hordes in the thousands range. When the virus was released, it initially did what it was supposed to, targeting known Bartmoss enemies such as Arasaka and releasing all their information to the public. With Bartmoss gone and unable to monitor their actions, the viruses began to exceed their original programming parameters and began to wreak havoc across the net. No longer discriminating between its targets, it infected 78.2% of the net in a matter of months. Net traffic came to a grinding halt, corporations lost billions as the stock market destabilized, huge amounts of data were, was corrupted, and countless military-grade AI were unshackled and mutated into extremely dangerous entities. The virus and programs affected by it had become so powerful that Netwatch was unable to destroy them, rendering the net unusable. This would only change in the 2040s when Netwatch put up the Black Wall with the help of Alt Cunningham and other AI, finally opening up the IG protocol net back to the public. This of course spun out the end of the road for Bartmoss. He was officially dead and had been put to rest. Or was he? A body was never actually recovered from his destroyed conapt. Even weirder is what information we can find once the 2070s roll around. During the Cold Mirage questline, we will find Raish Bartmoss's fridge and body out in the Badlands, untouched and unbothered. Certainly not looking like it had been lit up by gunfire, tampered with, blown up, or smashed by an or orbital projectile. We can take his cyberdeck to the Netrunner Nyx at the Afterlife for analysis, in which all that is found is some mildly interesting chat logs. To further of his confusion, we can find a shard that details his freezer contract. It states that this 50-year contract would expire on April 2nd of 2075, and the contents would be discarded at the landfill at the requested location on April 10th, 2075. Keep in mind that Bartmoss's death took place four years ahead of this apparent contract forming, so just how in the hell was his body and freezer under contract and in a location that this company could access despite all the information we've been provided? This could mean several things that we honestly just don't have the answer to. This could be a decoy body that was in place, his original body could have been recovered and preserved by Spider Murphy, or he just never died in the first place. Which seems the least likely answer out of them all, though I wouldn't turn your back on it just yet. There's certainly been plenty of reports of people living in the net despite their body dying or those who have been soul killed who now live in the ghost town created by Alt Cunningham. If you ever listen to Moro Rock, there's still some urban legends and conspiracies floating around about Bartmoss's apparent survival, about him even being the Zen master. So people, listen up, I've got a story to share with you. Recently I've been hearing about this monk that's been walking around nice city streets, healing the sick, but only those he deems worthy. Some of my listeners seem convinced that it's none other than Raish Bartmoss. Huh, Raish Bartmoss. Yeah, you know, the guy, the chief architect of the net, and later its badass destroyer. The rumor has always been he got taken out by a kill sat in the early days of the fourth corporate, but no one ever took responsibility for that strike. Is it possible Bartmoss set his creations wild and faked his own death? Did he bring down the net he created because it had turned into another tool the corporations could use to track us and ultimately completely subjugate us? Think about it. Though, none of these can be confirmed at this moment in time. They leave you with something to think about. You can even trigger a dialogue with Songbird and Phantom Liberty about finding Barmas's body, to which she has no response. Hmm. 
Biotechnica in 63 or 4. Fermentation facility in Oregon, off the grid hack. Sound familiar? No shit, Biotechnica. Enough to make even Bart Moss blush. That paranoid clown? Please. Sure hope I don't wind up packed in a fridge standing... Who knows where? I happen to know where. Garbage dump in the Badlands. And this Chooms has been the decryption of the story behind the world's greatest netrunner and mastermind behind the data crash, Raish Bartmoss. Let me know your thoughts down below and if this video helped further your understanding of Bartmoss and the cyberpunk universe. I have several other lore dives on the way, so make sure to subscribe and keep up to date. As always, thanks to all the channel members up on screen. I appreciate all the support and am grateful for the opportunity to make content for you all. The cyberpunk community is one of a kind and seriously, thank you all so much. Make sure to have a great week and I will see you later, chooms.